Welcome back, welcome back. Well, one group who had a pretty bad election on the face of it was the uh, opinion pollsters. Most of them grossly overestimated how well the third party, the Liberal Democrats, were going to do. So let's hear it now for one pollster who was eerily accurate in his prediction. One month ago, I was delighted to be joined here by the famed polling guru, Robert Worcester himself, or it was he, and this was his prediction. That was a full month ago, he said this, about the UK result. The rules state that the Prime Minister carries on until he or she cannot form a government. But usually in this country, there is a, a, a convention that if they can see that there's no chance of it, they'll go fairly quickly. And I suspect by Monday morning, after the 6th of May election, that David Cameron will be at 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister of this country. Amazing, amazingly accurate, and the great guru of polling, and the dean, and the, in fact, the principal of uh, University of Kent, Bob Worcester, Robert Worcester's here, welcome. Yeah. And also with us, and we'll come on to Ruth in a moment, because Ruth Lee, one of the outstanding economists in London, has got some views on the economy and what's going to happen to that after this election and with all these troubles going on in a moment. So we'll come on to that in a moment, Ruth. But starting with you, Robert, the, uh, that was a, a brilliant prediction, wasn't it? Even a blind pig gets an acorn once in a while, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did the election and the figures work out for you? I mean, were you surprised, actually, by the relatively low number of seats compared to what people expected that well, the Liberal Democrats would get? Yes. Uh, to some degree, but that was uh, that was a sideshow in a way. It got a huge media attention, just as the gaffe that uh, uh, of leaving the microphone on and saying rude things about a Labour voter got Gordon Brown into trouble. But these things are three-day wonders for the most part. They're announced one day or done one day. They're reacted to the second day in British elections, and then they're forgotten the third day as the caravan moves on. This was an election that was really transformed and uh, in, if there wouldn't have been the increase in turnout for instance from 61 percent to 66 percent 65 and a half uh, if it hadn't been for that first debate debates really changed the nature of British elections and they've changed it for good you think well I think so although there was uh, the jury's out on that because it has tilted toward the American presidential style and a great deal more of interest in the public and certainly in the media uh, on image and uh, the, the presentation and style rather than on the policies. There was relatively little discussion about issues. Was it right not to do that because people calculated that the public was bored with issues or was it wrong because it was irresponsible? No, neither, really. Mm. It was uh, the nature of things, and I'm sure that David Cameron, who would have been in his own right prime minister by now if he hadn't had that debate, and Gordon Brown as well, both rue the day they agreed to these kind of debates. Uh, in my own view, a much better situation would have been for them to have agreed to do a double, and then the second one do a triple with uh, uh, Nick Clegg, and in the last debate, or in any other order, all the candidates to have, as sometimes American uh, debates are, with three, four, six, seven candidates, so that it would have been more dispersed and less the focus. And I think the election was lost, in a way, by David Cameron on the first moment of the first debate when the camera caught him looking absolutely frozen with fear. He was, he was clearly just so anxious and so uptight, and this was completely different than his, in, than his image had been. You're right, he, was, he did look nervous in that uh, first debate. He recovered in the other two debates. Yes, he did. He, but he did. But in that, was there any other really sort of mega point of change in this? one decisive moment, I mean, one not misspeaking? That, not that I saw in the numbers, because we were tracking very frequently, and particularly uh, in the marginals, because the Reuters organization uh, commissioned us to do a, a, a marginals poll 
of 57 seats, 57 battleground seats, where the swing was between 5 and 9 percent. Uh, and it was more or less every week. And so we were able to track fairly carefully all of these things. And we, that was the only one that really upstaged everything else. And I described it as uh, stasis, chaos for a few days, and then stasis at a different level. Right. Let me turn for a minute to the e economic issue, if I can, with, with Ruth. Um, Ruth, what this weekend are the bankers of the world? What are their conclusions they're drawing about this British election? Are they concentrating on the indecisive nature of the outcomings at this particular moment? or what? Well, I think they are, and they are concerned about a hung parliament, and certainly the sterling did fall back today, and gilts fell back away as well. But the truth is, in the markets at the moment, we're a bit of a sideshow, because of course what is happening yeah. is there's a lot of meltdown in the Eurozone, particularly from Greece, and then contagion onto Portugal and Spain, and possibly Ireland and Italy. And because we're not in the Eurozone, fortunately we're not part of this contagion. But the markets aren't going to let us off, and the truth is they will be looking for some sort of government at some point that come out with, can come out with some very decisive decisions as to about what should be done with our fiscal deficit, which is just horrific. But and, they are, and they are drawing what conclusions at the moment? That, that the, the bankers are demanding what, instant action or...? They, they would like uh, they would like a, a government to be settled by Monday or Tuesday. I mean, that, they're talking around the markets. That that's what people tell me. But I think they're being extraordinarily patient and relaxed about it because they sort of take the view that at some point next week there will be some sort of government, whether it's a conservative liberal coalition or a minority conservative government, that will actually start talking about getting down the deficit. And as I say, I, th I do think the focus of their concern is slightly elsewhere. But and it was interesting today that the credit rate agencies that everybody talks about and fears all the time you know are they really going to downgrade our our debt our government debt from the coveted triple a down to double a or something even worse than that two of them the two major ones in other words standard and Poor's and moody's have said today they really have no intention of downgrading the debt so slightly to my surprise <laughs> they seem relatively relaxed but how long that will last is the moot point why why that change why are they being momentarily liberal towards Britain and Britain's economy. Is it because other economies are worse or because they are actually reassured by something they saw in this election? I think it's mainly the former. I mean, ironically, I was looking at the, one of the leading financial papers in this country. On Wednesday, this was, of course, the day before the election, and they were saying that British gilts, people are actually buying into British gilts because, of course, they were shifting out of the more dangerous assets like either the, the, the government debt of, of Spain or Portugal or indeed equities. Equities have had a shocking time this week. The equity markets really have taken a, a, a bloodbath, quite honestly. And they're actually treating British gilts, uh, government gilts, as a safe haven. And I, th I thought this was extraordinary when you have a, a deficit in this country of over 11.5% of GDP. But there's obviously, we're, we're not quite, less, it's, it's the old story, you know, in the <laughs> land of, the, sh of the, the, the short, it's the slightly taller one that's better off than the others. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. But the trouble is with markets, the trouble is with markets, they take these attitudes and they, you know, they decide what's right and then suddenly something will click and then, of course, they will move on to their next target. And the real fear is that we could be the next target. Target. Do you think Britain could be the next target to that marauding force of bankers and traders? To some degree it depends on how long these politicians are in negotiation and Gordon Brown is famous for his hanging on at all costs and nothing so focuses the mind of a politician in my experience is the threat of loss of office and he's hanging on by his fingernails at the moment. If he doesn't go soon I suspect we may be the object of attention. But are coalitions the right idea in the sense that some people say that coalitions are sort of automatically weak? But they're not necessarily weak, are they? No, but uh, it's the point that Malcolm Rifkin made uh, earlier, which is that uh, they have to be more or less consonant in their policies uh, if they're going to stick together. It's the Benjamin Franklin, if we don't stick together, we'll, or if we, yeah, if we don't hang stick together, we'll hang whatever, separately. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, hang together, then we yeah, all yeah. hang separately. That's, that's the quote. Uh, this situation is one that is uh, fragile because the one thing that is most important to the Liberal Democrats and to their leader, Nick Clegg, 
is to change the voting system to proportional representation. Mm -hmm. The one thing that the Tories will not under any circumstance consonant is uh, the at the moving to the proportional representation. Well, as people say about proportional representation, is once you bring it in, you can't really ever get rid of it again. Very difficult. Myself, as a political scientist rather than a pollster, I favor the alternative transferable vote because it keeps the link with the local MP, which is a very important aspect of the British democracy. And what do you feel, Ruth? When, do you feel a certain fear when you invest in a well, in a company, in a country that is that is clearly a coalition. Well, I of course, coalitions are very common uh, outside the United yeah, but Kingdom. Do you, do you, you think feel Germany, slightly insecure sometimes? I think if you invested in Germany, you'd feel reasonably secure. If you were buying German bonds, you'd feel very secure. And of yeah. course, it's it's one coalition after another. But Germany has a history of coalition government. Of course, we don't. But even there, their coalition it begins to look rather shaky, if I may say so. But uh, and then, of course, other countries have coalitions which are much less stable. But I think it depends on uh, all sorts of other factors. But we're not used to coalitions. I mean, the last coalition, or where we didn't, it wasn't a proper coalition in the 1970s, but there was the Lib Lab Pact, of course, which wasn't terrifically stable. And uh, minority governments also tend to be rather weak in this country. But so really, uh, as far as the markets here are concerned about Britain, we're really into uncharted territory. But I was interested today, again, talking around the markets, that if they feel that, that Cameron can form some sort of government, whether he does it as a minority or he gets the Liberals in on some sort of deal, but I agree, not PR, you can forget that, then I think the markets would feel relatively relaxed. But, but would you reassured. would you feel more shaky about the investing backing the euro or or backing the pound or what? Well, at the moment, I think I would steer clear of the euro. I think their difficulties are really absolutely extraordinarily difficult. And it seems that every decision that's made by whether it's a German politician or the ECB seems to make things worse and not better. Right. Well, <laughs> at that point in the proceedings, we've got to stop for a second. So much for what the politicians think that these results mean and the economists and so on. But what do they mean for the world? We'll be looking at that after this.